This is the City of Wapanka City Plan Commission meeting. All right, uh, welcome everybody to our regular scheduled City Planning Commission meeting. I call this meeting to order. In attendance, we have uh, in attendance in the council chambers, we have uh, the commissioners Olson, Fair, Barons, uh, Mayor Brian Smith, and then uh, virtually we have Alan Keelan, John Kinnear, and Tracy Barrent. Um, as uh, commissioners, and then we also have Andrew Dean and Jeff Fisher. Is what's that? Jeff Sanders. Sanders. I'm yeah, I'm sorry, Jeff Sanders. Sanders. What did I say? Jeff Fisher, the old Tennessee Titans coach. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's on too. And, <laughs> yeah. Why is he on? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, sorry about that, Jeff. All right, uh, you have an agenda in front of you. Uh, we would just need a motion to approve. Alan says so moved. Okay. Motion by Keelan, second by Olson, that we approve the agenda. Discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Against? Motion carried. Uh, we have our annual review of our code of ethics. Um, we didn't do that last month, huh? Um, so this is uh, something that we do after the election in April of every year. We put it in your packet, and we hope that you go through it. Uh, most of us have multiple meetings that we go through the same thing. So unless we have any questions, I'll just say that uh, you've received it, and uh, I'll sign off that uh, we have reviewed it. And we'll put it in our minutes uh, that we have reviewed that. Uh, we have uh, some minutes of some meetings that we have to clean up here. We have approval of our Planning Commission minutes from the public hearing from May 6th and then the regular minutes from the May 6th, 2020 meeting. We would need a motion to approve those and place those on file. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, motion, uh, motion by Barron, second by uh, Fair, that we approve uh, those two minutes of meetings from May. Discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Against? Motion carried. Action items. So we have the uh, one big item tonight, the site plan review for... The Wapaka School District uh, on 10th Street property, and Aaron, you want to just introduce the people that we have here, and then um, also um, absolutely tell us what we're doing here. All right, so we have Matt Vassar from the school district. Uh, we have Bob Breest, and then we have, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Devin, I thought that was you, Devin. Uh, thank you, Devin, for working with us in a short manner. I know we were able to meet with uh, Matt and Bob last Thursday, and when I say we, I mean myself, Justin Barons, and uh, Jeff Sanders, um, and they worked very uh, rapidly to get some changes um, to reflect some concerns we had with this, the original site plan. Um, I can tell you those changes have been made, but before I get into that, I'm going to I'm going to hand it over to uh, Jeff Sanders just because we have his zoning um, staff report up here. And Jeff, is there anything you want to touch on here? I guess, well, before and before I even get into that, is the school district is looking to put up a, a garage um, on the, what you guys would know as the old school district uh, bus garage property. They're using it as maintenance. Um, they're trying to make it more workable for workable for that. This is one of four lots that they had. They kind of subdivided the lots. Um, sold one of them to Home and Away Ministries. You guys actually uh, come forward for that. Um, and this is one of the three they have remaining um, on 10th Street. So uh, just to kind of set it up, um, Jeff, uh, anything you want to speak on as far as the <laughs> staff report you have here in our packet? Uh, yeah, thanks, Aaron. So as, uh, as Aaron mentioned a moment ago, uh, we met with representatives of the district, and that, that meeting resulted in an amended site plan. The report you have before you is the initial site plan that came and the deadline for for my report going to uh, 
to Rhonda to get to the plan commission was the day before I actually got the information that I needed regarding height maximum and the minimum lot area. So you'll notice uh, the table on the bottom of page one of my report, there's two sections that say not provided and unknown. Uh, subsequent to this report being written, they have been provided and they are known. Uh, so the height maximum was 20 feet. Actually, that's incorrect. There's a there's a conflict within the zoning ordinance. One section says 20 feet. The other one says um, implies allowing for, I should say implies states, matter of fact, that you can have a two-story structure. Um, a two-story structure, it's pretty tough to accommodate two stories within 20 feet. So the, the height maximum uh, is compliant with the proposed structure now. And then we had the minimum lot area, and that actually was part of the discussion that Aaron and Justin and I had uh, during the meeting with the district to come up with the amended site plan that I suspect Aaron has available somewhere here. Uh, I do. So what I'm going to do, Jeff, is I'm going to take us to the. Um, sorry, I got two keyboards here. Seventeen. I'm going to take us to the original site plan that was submitted, and we can kind of talk through some of the concerns we had, and then I'm going to show them the amended one, um, in which those those concerns were addressed. So, so the, concerns the concerns we had here, the, the three, there was kind of three big ones. And Justin, um, feel free to, to uh, chime in whenever. So as you can see here, the original site plan came in. There was parking stalls that protruded into the right of way, um, which was a concern. If there's any other work, any work to be done in the future, that obviously would be um, a concern. They would lose that. Uh, there was a, there's a 10% minimum green space that has to be met for this district, and we didn't have that in our original plan and then there was an issue with the driveway right now this is all kind of wide open uh, we have a driveway ordinance in our public works section of our code that calls for a maximum driveway width of is it 36 feet justin for a commercial yes for commercial um and they actually uh cleaned that up by creating two driveway accesses both are within are in compliance um, and I'll show you what that looks like here. Kind of their amended. So, Aaron, before you get the one we were just looking at is the old. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yep. And I can I'll go right back there if you'd like. This is the new, the one that we have up right now. Be able to zoom in a little bit. Absolutely. And so you can see uh, the two driveway points. Uh, this is kind of closed off. This is all wide open right now. They've put in the plan how they'll have these access points here. You can see the green space and how they moved the parking to the north side of the building and to the east side of the building to allow for that. Um, what, Jeff and Justin, what if there's was there one more a large change that was... That was made out of those comments, or is that pretty much? No, I think that's it, Justin. Do you remember anything else? I mean, it was the for me, it was the the structure itself, its location, and the ten percent, and the parking. Obviously, we had some quite a few discussions about parking. Right. In which they all addressed, um, which is what you see here as a result. Right. And just so it's off the screen right now, but the open space on site, uh, as proposed, is I believe 17.3 percent. My memory serves. I think there's a legend over to the right of that diagram. Uh, Actually, I pulled my own up right now. It's 17.3, so 37.95 square feet. Justin, I think if you want to touch on any of the strand things, I think those are the main things that strand also um, identified. And then there was just a couple of comments as far as just things to add to the plan as far as verbiage and things like that. That was well. Anything else that you would work with strand on? Um, no, the main things strand picked up on the same things that Jeff picked up on. Um, with the wide open space and the parking crossing over the right of way. Uh, I mean, we came to agreement here. It looks pretty well done now. With the two separate driveway openings and the parking shifted around. Um, 
<clears throat> some other minor comments and just adding a few more plan notes talked about on that and other uh, plan reviews you know just increasing the detail to help with contractors build this the way that the school district would want so it appears that you know all those changes the minor changes have been uh, made and certainly the major one walk through that already so I think we're, we're pretty well good to go here is there, anything, is there anything, Matt or Devin or Bob, um, that you guys want to speak to, or is there any questions from the plan commissioners uh, for them? And if if there is, you guys feel free to go up to the podium and speak into the microphone. Any questions from plan commissioners? Um, I count uh, ten different parking stalls. Is that correct? How many stalls did we end up with, guys? Is it I'm six? looking at the old one. I know. I just mean we shifted those. Is that, I mean, would 10, uh, would there ever be any reason to have more than 10 cars there? No. No. So there's been five or six people working back there. I believe we went from 10 to 6. Yeah. So oh, okay. Because the old one had 10. Yeah. And this new one is has only 6? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was when we had to move it out of this uh this area here with the green space um, that kind of shifted and we had a conversation about that was 10 needed it wasn't needed per the zoning ordinance and it was not needed Matt didn't feel like for the operations either. and is one required to be a uh, handicap parking uh, I see there's a sign there there's a picture there. of one I don't believe there's not, there's not. Nope. ADA nope. requirements are uh, when you have a parking lot that has 26 to 49 stalls, you must have one designated as ADA. Um, fewer than 26, you are not required under American Disabilities Act. Okay. Okay. And Jeff, as long as you're talking, what do you perceive to be in that green space, that the new projected green space? What, what kind of um, landscaping, if you will? Uh, I mean, it's an excellent question. Unfortunately, the zoning ordinance doesn't provide direction. It doesn't say what should be there. It says what cannot be included. So pavers and gravel and other things that are impervious or semi-pervious semi -pervious surfaces are not permissible. Um, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if Keller and Rieker Milky and others have a proposal for it. I'm sure if they do, Mr. Flanagan will weigh in. Um, but again, I think as long as it meets our definition of open space, which focuses on what it can't be, not what it can be, uh, I think we would be in a position to approve it. All right. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments? We would be looking for uh, approval of this site plan review. And, and as I understand it, is, uh, Can I just jump in and ask about the ADA one more time? I'm, I'm not sure that the zero requirement, if you could just check in on that. Yeah, we certainly can. Jeff, do you want to? I'm rapidly navigating to the section of the statutes which governs that. And it may take me a little while to get there, so if there are any other discussions, please don't wait for me. Okay. The, plan the plan is showing one. Is yeah, that the intent? Okay. Is to include one? Well, it shows a, uh, uh, the parking uh, pavement markings and it shows one handicap sign there. I don't know why it would be there if there wasn't one necessary. That's why I asked the question. Well, it's not a requirement, but most businesses build it in just as part of parking. Regardless of what the requirement is, most, most businesses just include one for ADA. So regardless if it is or is not, guys, is that the is it still the intent to have one? The only thing I take that back. My apologies. Incorrect. It's, a, it's one to twenty five spaces requires one, and twenty six to fifty now requires two. I apologize. That there were updates in twenty March of twenty twelve. Thank you. And then, um, if you could just uh, have their engineer. Um, confirm that the dimensions and the accessible route pattern does meet that um i i'm not sure with with parallel parking like that what the i don't remember the requirement i just know we need at least one um if they could just confirm the layout of that as well okay 
I, I don't know if you heard that, John, but uh, they said they will. Yep. Thank you. Yep. John, thanks for the question on the uh, handicap as well. Could, could, Aaron, could you just, um, there was also some photographs in here of the existing fencing. Is that all going to stay as is, or how is that going to be impacted? Uh, that's a good question. Jeff, did you pick up on that at all? Um, I actually, I don't recall having a discussion about existing fencing. And if I, if I didn't include that in the report, which I didn't, obviously, I admitted it. Um, that would be my error. Um, I know that there was a digital image that showed some fencing on site. Was I think I would refer this question to Mr. Flanagan. Uh, were the was the was that fencing intended to be retained or removed or other? Devin, Devin could you is it okay if or whoever's going to speak? Could you guys go up to the mic? That'd be awesome. Thank you. Any, um, any of the mic. We have to the podium or, or you could here, sit or right here too. Yeah, any one of yeah. them. The existing fencing on the east side would remain. The north side would naturally be removed because that actually goes through the building where the new, the, this new building be located. And the west fencing for uh, from the edge, from the south lot line which north will be removed. The property to the south, that fencing will remain. So the, so the photograph that we received in our packet, it says uh, existing gravel conditions, but it actually shows the fencing facing southeast. Pages, pages 30 and 31 have the no. photographs of the fence. You can see the, the west fencing and the north fencing on this property would be removed. East fencing would remain, and the fencing on the property that is south of this property would remain. Alan, did you have something to say? I'm sorry, we missed it if you did. I was saying that pages 30 and 31 have photographs of the existing fencing. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. All right. All right. Anything, Anything else? else? Anything else? All right. All right. Uh, so we would need uh, a motion to approve the site plan review. This is Alan. A second. We got a motion by Keelan, second by Barron, that we approve the site plan review for the Opaca School District on their 10th Street, Street property. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And, and uh, Pat Fair is abstaining. He's a member of the school board, so he feels that he needs to abstain. So the motion carries. All right. All right. Uh, uh, thanks. Good luck, Good luck to you guys. Uh, uh, you can stay if you want. Uh, your, choice. your choice. But uh, next, up next up, we have under discussion items, we have the comprehensive plan and zoning code update. Did you have pictures you were going to show us? Well, they're the same ones that were up there. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we're good then. <laughs> Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew, Andrew are you? Is Andrew still on? I'm still, I'm still on. on. <clears throat> All right. Do you want to give an update on the comp plan first, and then uh, Jeff can? Well, oh, geez, I mean, we were we were here quite a quite a long time on zoning code, but Andrew, do you want to touch on comp plan? I do. Can I? Is it okay if I share my screen? Sure. Sure. Okay. Because I put together a little presentation and. I will uh, kind of whip through it pretty quickly. Um, I do want to, I can keep it, you know, I can really whip through this thing really fast. Or um, I know we were here pretty late the other night. Um, I, I, I could probably get through it and do it justice in maybe 15 to 20 minutes if that's, uh, if people can, uh, are good with that. Um, 
That sounds good, Andrew. Can do you? Uh, did you request to? There we go. Well done. So, presenter view. Presenter view. Okay. Um, are you seeing the the title slide? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. And I took my video off because it was slowing down the bandwidth, and uh, I still haven't managed to convince my wife to cut my hair. So uh, here we go. Um, and I'm going to set, set a little timer. So I start to uh, try to wrap this up by 6, 6.05 at the latest. Before I jump into this, I just wanted to um, give a little peek at this kind of side project we're working on with Aaron in the chamber and the wiki folks and Justin. Uh, we're putting together a brochure or a guide for downtown Main Street that's going to help uh, welcome some of the visitors this 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 season uh, and give it a little sneak peek to the Main Street reconstruction project. And um, so I just thought I'd, sh I'd share that real quick. Um, our timeline, you know, with the COVID pandemic, it's it's adjusted our timeline a little bit, but we're still on track for finishing this plan up by the end of the year. Um, and um, I really don't see any any concern with that. A lot of heavy lifting has been done, and uh, allowed to to move through this uh, efficiently and finish this project up by the uh, end of the year. I I did want to mention. The intent is here, and as we kind of do a little bit of a two-step, and Jeff talked through it yesterday, but it's probably worth reiterating that uh, the the intent would be to go back and revise your, your zoning map and, and possibly some of your zoning districts after we adopt the, the comprehensive plan, including the future land use map. Um, is my audio coming through okay, Aaron? Yep, you're good. You're good, Andrew. Okay. okay. Zoom just told me that uh, it was potentially not. So um, we've identified the goals, and and I'm not going to belabor these. I'm actually not even going to read them. I'm just going to kind of go through them on the screen, the goals for each of the chapters, and just to kind of keep people's head in the game a little bit as as uh, this is kind of a long process. We kind of worked through housing and neighborhoods already and uh, gave that a, a pretty good shake. Kind of drilling in right now on land use and mobility, uh, so strengthening commercial mixed-use districts, providing a safe and reliable transportation network. We've, uh, I've, right now, I've got this sort of the economic development chapter titled "A Thriving Economy," um, and and that's strengthening, diversifying the the local economy, supporting a mix of, of different job types, attracting and retaining talented individuals to recognizing the importance of workforce and talent attraction. Combine parks, infrastructure, environment into one chapter. So we'll, we'll kind of look at parks, trails, uh, and also municipal utilities um, as in one chapter. Culture, um, I thought it was, you know, you guys have an arts and culture plan. It, I think it's one of your unique assets, and so having a chapter on or culture, health, and community, um, I thought made some sense. Uh, and, and I think a lot of that can just be lifted from some of the existing plans that are already uh, in place. And then finally, sort of effective and efficient government, uh, or um, which I think is, is going to tie in nicely with the strategic plan. I think that's really an opportunity where we kind of tie this thing back to the strategic plan and put together um, a kind of implementation framework that creates a framework for kind of continual process improvement and interaction with the strategic plan over time. So I've been banging away at a market analysis, uh, market study to inform the update of, of the comprehensive plan, including the goals, strategies, and actions. And the objective is to Identify market potentials, housing, commercial, office, light industrial, et cetera. And then try to quantify what we think that future real estate demand is. Um, and then uh, provide recommendations based on that analysis, um, as well as based on public input we get. 
um, that addresses economic development activities uh, in the economic development chapter. Is It's also going to inform land use uh, goals objectives. It will inform transportation goals objectives. And I, I guess I um, just want to sort of point out there's a little, I think it's a better approach than what's typically done. It's I like to consider this market driven planning where we're, we're actually we're not just pulling numbers high out of the sky. We're actually trying to drill down and and kind of sharpen the pencil a little bit and look at actual supply demand um, and its impacts on the <coughs> land use. So um, in the last comprehensive plan, some of you were we're around then and back in 2005, six, seven, when you put this thing together. And this is typical. What you do is you project land use demand based on population estimates. The population estimates you typically just pull from the Department of Administration. And sometimes they get tweaked through regional planning or the consultant, but more or less they're, they're just past population trends extrapolated into the future. And then you take you take benchmark figures, you sort of look at your existing land uses now and you say, okay, what does it take to support, um, how many acreages does it take to support business or industrial or residential? And then you apply those factors um, against your, your population projections and you come up with these, um, I, you know, oftentimes, you know, maybe not as accurate as possible future land use projections. And so, and, and so we're kind of digging down a little We look at what the future demand is for different types of land uses, but where where it should go. And when I'm doing market studies, I really like to start with what are the community assets, economic development, and market analysis is really about understanding community assets and strengths. And I think you've done a good job talking through a lot of these. Um, I'm not going to list list them all, but um, inventorying and describing some of the key community assets. Um, in the community, um, and then particularly now thinking about how these assets may be positioned in light of COVID. I think you've got some really strong assets here. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, maybe a weakness uh, uh, when we look at the, sh the low number of students in the zero to four or elementary middle school uh, cohort age ranges as a three months ago becomes a strength. Uh, perhaps having more space available in the school system, having not as many students could be very attractive for somebody who wants to have their kid learning in person but not be piled on top uh, in, a, in a room with 30, 40 other kids uh, uh, like my daughter here in Appleton. So um, I think it's worth thinking through these assets, especially now uh, given the current situation. And then what are some of the challenges uh, besides the pandemic, uh, you know, population growth, um, a challenge, I've sort of heard that loud and clear when it comes to workforce. Um, the darker areas on this map are 2019-2024 um, um, uh, census tracts or zip codes where we're experiencing, we're projecting greater population growth. And then the lightest areas are those where you're expecting negative growth or zero growth. And what's interesting here, just visually looking at this, it almost, um, and then also comparing some work I did in Clintonville probably five years ago, a lot of the state numbers and the county numbers, um, I think when you extrapolate those down without really looking too closely, um, paint a fairly bleak picture for population growth in Wapaka. But when we drill down a little bit further, I think there's some positive things happening. Um, and looking at this map, it you start to see some of that creeping in towards, you know, up along 10 from Amherst and Stevens Point, Plover. And it seems to me that, you know, Wapak is in an area that um, it's it's not as dire situation as some of the more rural areas. So, um, and then funding is always a challenge. Um, and that's something I've got some kind of thoughts on. Uh, I'll talk through not tonight, but I'm gonna follow up with, with Aaron. Um, Wapaka's business mix is really interesting. You know, you got really strong concentrations in man manufacturing. Manufacturing's off the charts. Um, you don't have a ton of manufacturing businesses, but in terms of their contribution to employment, you know, it's one fourth of the workforce, almost two, you know, 17 or 50 employees. Retail trade, you've got 
a ton of businesses as well as a ton of employees. And then uh, education, healthcare, and hospitality are the other concentrations. And so I think part of the opportunity here is, you know, retraining some of these folks, um, upskilling them, and moving them into, you know, as, as per perhaps we lose some of these jobs and some of these sectors as a result of the pandemic, but there's, there's the opportunity to retool folks and move them into some higher um, income occupations and industries. There's also, um, what's surprising to me is the information, finance, uh, real estate, rentals, what we consider like professional white collar employment is a little bit lower. It was actually, it's quite a bit lower than I thought going into this project. And I, but I think that with your amenities is just a huge growth opportunity in terms of um, uh, getting more remote workers in, into Wapaka um, over time. So Wapaka is, um, this is actually, I think the county, but it's um, helpful to sort of look at the county. The orange is more recent, 2018. The blue is 2010. You know, it's interesting to look at the countywide, just the growth in manufacturing is just really impressive. The other sectors with growth, natural resources, construction, you know, and it seems like Wapaka is doing well in those areas. Um, and and, and uh, hopefully we'll continue. Um, as I pointed out before, uh, some of those professional service jobs aren't aren't as high as, as maybe I might have expected and I think but I think those are, are real um, opportunity areas. When we look at the workforce, you know, there's this opportunity to increase the number of remote workers. Um, so we market the area and we start looking at, at folks that, that are newly unhinged and 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 uh, have the ability to work remotely and want to be in a in an area with high uh, outdoor amenities. Um, and then we look also at opportunities to um, attract those out-of-town workers that are commuting into town. Um, Wapaka, compared to all the other cities in the county, has the highest imbalance of inflow, outflow workers. So on a daily basis, you've got over 5,000 people coming in, just 2,000 people leaving, and about 1,000 people that will live and work in town. Um, so our, our opportunity is really to grab from both of those uh, horizontal um, arrows and, and really grow the number of people are living and working in the city of Wapaka or nearby. And that little dot bubble diagram on the side is uh, job employment concentrations in the county. Um, and it's pretty, um, again, that it's kind of fun to look at these graphs sometimes, but you really notice that there's a strong concentration. Um, a couple of those bubbles, I think, were probably indicative of um, Kmart or Shopko that are no longer here. but. Um, got a, a strong concentration of employment, uh, and which is significant because oftentimes economic development and job growth and population growth is often predicated on attracting and driving more jobs, creating more jobs. You guys have the jobs, so in some aspects, the hard part is, is kind of already done. Um, when we look at employment projections, and this is by the Fox uh, development area, Fox Valley development area, um, Employment projections, so this is a broader region, several counties, um, but you could extrapolate this down to the county and to the community, but you look at the, the growth, the biggest growth are on a lot of these jobs that are, um, you know, jobs that pe people can take with them, self-employed, professional business service jobs. When you look at the region, um, this is where a lot of the growth is. Um, and I think the reason manufacturing doesn't pop on there like it, like we saw in the last figures is because of automation and the uh, and the expectation that automation will um, uh, will uh, sort of flatten out uh, manufacturing jobs. So there'll still be a demand for folks in manufacturing, significant demand, but in fact, the highest demand of any category, but uh, it, the job growth may not be happening as fast as we thought. So I'm gonna get into some of these land uses and sort of what this means. I'm going to do a deep dive into real into housing in my next eight minutes, and then I'm going to very quickly skim over some of the other categories that I didn't want to, um, I didn't go as deep into that. Housing is really a big driver because it's priority for you, but also because it's by far the largest land use. And when you look at back over the last 20 years, um, it's interesting to look at um, single family in blue, multifamily in orange, you know, multifamily, because of um, cycles and uh, in the market and financing and interest rates, you know, 
tends to come in these bursts. And it appears as though we're in the middle, we may be uh, at the front end of one of those bursts right now. Um, uh, we've got um, between the, uh, the, the two projects, the project that just went in last year, the reserve adding 50 some units in Eastgate and the Timber Ridge project we've got uh, on the hopper coming up um, and then some workforce projects that we're hoping to get in over the next couple of years. I think we it's reasonable to assume um, that, that this trend could continue. And then with the Green Tree purchasing up some of the properties in Eastgate and Swan Park and elsewhere, um, there's a good opportunity for, it looks like there's a good opportunity for single family. The supply is, 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 uh, may, you know, may, um, the supply is primarily, you have a big supply of owner occupied housing units that are 150,000 or less, you know, the vast majority of units. And so those are great for younger families and younger cohorts. Um, and that's one of the areas that you're expected to increase. Uh, see increases by, so that's fantastic. Um, but you don't have a lot of, you, you know, you don't have a, as much of that higher end housing. Same on the renter occupied gross rent. You know, it's heavily clustered uh, in those bottom tiers um, and, and not as much on the higher end. Um, when we look at demand, and this is for the housing as well as the commercial demand, um, we create a model and a trade area um, in the study that was done that Brendan had commissioned in 2016, there was a fairly large trade area. I actually, just to be really conservative, I shrunk the trade area down to just include City of Wapak and the surrounding towns. Um, and I may, well, I, I've also got some data that's kind of relative to the zip code that matches the school district a little bit more. So kind of looking at it from different perspectives, but come, using a little bit more conservative approach. So when you look at, um, and this is look. This is factoring births, deaths, you know, local um, data from Wapaka County, um, net migration, mortality, fertility rates. Um, this is what we're seeing for a change in um, households um, by stage within this trade area um, over the next ten years. So you see a couple clusters, you know, 65 and older, and then that 35 to 44. Um, you see a couple um, bubbles there. So you got um, family households, trade up home buyers, and then you've got kind of the tail end of empty nesters, active seniors, and then a lot of older seniors. The um, housing real estate market, so we've broken this out for owner occupied demand. We broke break it out by estimated annual home buyers by age. So this is not, not just new um, uh, household formations, but this is also people that. Um, are buying homes and um, up shifting homes and moving within the trade area. So you can see it's you know anywhere to two to three two hundred people in the market um, for uh, for home every year um, over the next ten years. We look at annual home buyers by property type to try to segment this down and understand you know what this looks like. Overwhelming prior and this is using sort of national preference data, but. Overwhelming priority for detached single family homes, um, but also some demand for row houses, condos, um, and other living living arrangements. And then when you look at when you look at affordability, there's different ways to look at housing demand, but one of the most common is to look at affordability and well what how much house could people buy without exceeding 30% of their income? And if you look at the market here, um, you know, you've got uh, a significant number on the right side of that screen that, you know, here who can only afford, you know, 16% under 100,000, 14%. You got about a third that can that can purchase under 150. And you're supplying that in the market right now. You got another third that can kind of do this next tier um, <clears throat> or another quarter. And then you've got a significant chunk of folks, again, just based on income, um, and I would say this is may even be under this may be underplayed uh, because you have people within the trade area say that live in the chain of lakes that might not have high incomes but have high net worth. Um, but the point is, there's um, it's likely that um, you have you know you might have a, a bit of a gap or an opportunity at the higher end for owner occupied demand. 
And then when we look at rental demand, it's significantly um, higher in part because renters move a lot more often than homeowners um, every couple, you know, two to three years on average. Um, but we break this out and we can see there's a big demand for um, annual renters in that 25 to 44. And this um, actually jives really well. I had a conversation with the property manager at the reserve out in Eastgate, and he told me that most of the people moving in there are people in this age cohort and they're moving in because they're from the area and they want to move back and that's what they could find that was nice um, or because uh, they or their spouse lives you know either works in the fox cities or stevens point and it's a convenient place to live there's also a significant number of folks in that over 65 in age category and when you look at percentage increase that that's significant uh, over the next 10 years and then we break this out by annual renters by monthly rent and you, you obviously have a lot of people who can afford the lower rentals and you, you're already providing a lot of those. But you also, you also have a lot of people who can afford a much higher um, uh, price point for rental that isn't available. And so you don't really have much, if anything, um, available f you know, for over $1,200 in the market. The stuff that's just getting built, the Timber Ridge was up to about 1100 I believe, maybe 1150 um, but you got significant numbers of people who could afford to pay more for, for rental. So conclusions and recommendations, and this is, you know, we can we can talk talk through this um, more. Um, but I'm I'm saying I think a, a conservative approach for the city to would be to target about 20 units of owner occupied housing per year, um, and that could include a mix of product types, um, and uh, um, and uh, I'm not sure how I, yeah, I have 50 there. Interrupt. Anyways, I, I missed that it should be 20. So I I think looking at the trade area and the, and the city's portion of the trade area and the, the model that I ran through, I, you know, I think 20 units of owner occupied housing per year is not unreasonable as a stretch goal. It's significantly more than what you've been in what you have been producing, but you may not have been producing as much, be, you know, for other factors. So if we can free up enough land, you know, I think there's an opportunity to to um, to get, um, you know, up to 20 units per year. And uh, let's skip over that. And then thinking about where some of this stuff goes, um, I think that's the other part of the of the puzzle is you know what is the market but then where do we go with it and so what i've identified here are just some areas that i'm going to be you know I'm, I'm kind of setting the stage for future discussions on the on the future land use map but the kmart site and north of the kmart site a lot of land up there i think with some transportation improvements and maybe some master planning there, there's an opportunity to add some significant amount of residential in there you already have a lot of uh, multifamily residential and condos, um, both owner and rental, on the north side of um, Fulton, and I think that trend can continue. Um, down here at the county highway, I'm sorry, the former county dump, uh, recycling center, uh, transfer uh, yard waste area, large tract of land. Uh, in fact, at the at the uh, comprehensive plan visioning session, uh, several folks said, "Hey, we've got this interchange out at 22. What, why don't we take advantage of it?" Um, well. I talked to Justin, I talked to the mayor, talked to some other folks. You know, I think this is worth looking at. Uh, you know, we're, we're planning out the next 10, 20 years. Let's take a look at the possibility of adding more housing here. And then likewise, as we look out at, at the Eastgate area, you know, originally planned for light industrial primarily. Um, I don't know if we, you know, do we want to have a bunch of storage in the city, you know, on sewer and water or should that go out in the town? Um, maybe we want to get more housing and more neighborhood-oriented businesses. And that seems to be what's happening naturally already, both in Eastgate as well as the uh, business industrial park south of Royalton. So um, that area south of Royalton, I think, is another great opportunity to maybe we look at both of these areas as, and let's maybe think about them as neighborhoods, emerging neighborhoods. What, what do people need when they move out to these areas? Um, and you know what are the types of businesses that, that, that might go into these i think um the areas in orange i'm i'm going to refer to in the land use chapter as sort of special planning areas i want to try to flesh out some kind of 
principles or approaches to those. Um, but I think those are areas where it might be worth spending a little bit of time and money maybe next year. You know, I, I don't think it needs to be a you know, hundred thousand dollars, but you know, maybe it's twenty or thirty thousand dollars. You know, bring in, you know, put some put a team together, maybe put together some concepts. You know, start really you know digging into these areas a little bit and seeing what we can do to market some of these areas, um, and then also look at um, addressing these in the through the zoning. Um, and then as we look downtown, similarly, uh, similar scenario downtown. Um, again, the orange is kind of what I'm going to call a special planning area. The blues are areas where I, I think there's an opportunity to do some uh, infill residential development downtown. Um, I do have a blue going over the, the you know city police station, I and mean, this is just you know conceptual. I, I, I believe the police station is adequate from what I understand, so I'm not proposing that that comes down. Um, but you own additional lots around there, and perhaps there's an opportunity to do a little higher density, you know, across from Quick Trip. Maybe there's an opportunity to do some walk-up townhomes or some stack flats on that parking area south of the um, south of the uh, uh, fire station. And then, as you know, we're we're working, <laughs> we're banging away on the Arts Center uh, and and Nino's, uh, the former um, St. Mary's. Again, great location, I think, for housing. And then, um, I guess, to conclude, the former county highway shop, um, that whole area, I think the opportunity here is to, you know, really think a little bit bigger than even just that five-acre parcel. You know, maybe it's worth looking at this area. It's a significant amount of riverfront. There's maybe 10 or 12 homes on here right now. There's really not that many. And I'm not suggesting that you go in there and wipe the slate clean. But maybe there's an opportunity here to do a little bit of site planning, do a little bit of visioning, maybe come up with a long range strategy to get some really build out some more housing right down here. It's a great location. It's right on the water, right next to a lot of amenities. Um, and then I'm going to just very quickly skim through the uh, the commercial. So the commercial real estate, again, I'm not done a kind of deep dive in this, but I'm not going to um, go into it in too much depth right now. Some of the recommendations from previous studies, you know, that I agree with is, well, one, I guess I want to point out, each of those dots is a business, and um, it sort of shows, one, you probably have a number of home-based businesses, but also you've got these sort of commercial districts or corridors or nodes. Um, we want to, I think it's important to continue to, you know, think about um, concentrating the commercial uses into fewer or or into the existing nodes rather than um, rather than expanding them. And what a lot of communities do, um, they, they, they just over zone for commercial land. And when you have too much supply of something, um, you don't have enough demand and then prices go down and you end up with, you know, lower quality, you know, development often. So I think it's important to think about these commercial districts and how we, um, how we address them, how we brand them, how we, create distinct commercial districts, how we concentrate commercial uses. Um, and so um, bringing additional consumers or residents into these commercial districts, I think is is one of the key recommendations here. And again, that can happen in Fulton Street, that can happen downtown. I think that could happen on Churchill Street, you know, the former Ruby's Pantry a parcel that's for sale, for example. Um, I talked to some realtors that doesn't sound like that building is, is you know, there's a people chomping at the bit to get into that building where Ruby's was in. You know, I, I think that could be a nice opportunity to get some infill uh, into Churchill that, that, that then supports the, 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 the restaurants and the breweries and, and the neighborhood retail that you already have. So the focus is on sort of retaining and expanding affordable, um, and then retaining and expanding affordable code compliant commercial spaces downtown. I mean, I, I think from a commercial standpoint, you know, your downtown is really your ace in the hole with as far as, you know, having something unique. And I've said it before, I, I really think you guys could be a top three, top five downtown in the state um, with just a little bit of tweaking. Um, and then I think um, also in terms of real estate demand, you know, as Jeff mentioned the other night, and it's a trend we see in a lot of communities. I don't know how it gets impacted by COVID, but, you know, look at business incubators, co-working, you know, 
places where people can maybe check into an office environment. Maybe they're working remotely. At, you know, maybe they're a doctor or a lawyer, or maybe they work, you know, at some management job in Chicago or Wausau or Appleton or wherever. But they might want access to a local office. Um, so I think that that's an opportunity. If we look at industrial um, here. There's just not a huge, you have a huge supply of industrial land and Rhonda's working on an existing land use map for me right now. So I'll actually have some numbers for you next time. But, um, you know, anecdotally, when you zoom over that in Google, you have a lot of industrial land. And, uh, and then uh, very little, um, you know, just based on the number of people knocking on the door asking about, you know, to do new projects, you know, not a lot of demand for new industrial. What you do seem to have is a lot of demand for expansion. So I think that maybe we focus on is just make sure we for industrial expansions, whether it's, you know, Presto or Gossamer or whatever, your, the foundry, et cetera. That seems to be the trend. Um, but I think on the flip side is we may want to look at some of those industrial areas, as I mentioned before, and, and look at opportunities to transition them into perhaps some some uh, mixed-use neighborhoods. And I think that's sort of already happening organically. And then institutional real estate, I haven't even really cracked this nut yet. Um, so this is something that I, we just need to discuss um, and have conversations with staff and Planning Commission and Council, you know, what are what are the public and or institutional land use demands, you know, whether it's the school or the, um, the hospital or the city or the county, um, we need to sort of wrap our, our, wrap our hands around that a little bit and give that some thought as we put together the future land use map. And this is my final slide. Uh, went a little bit over, but not too bad. Um, possible COVID impacts and opportunities. Um, a lot of the stuff I've been hearing is, you know, people like, just tend to agree with it, that the pandemic is going to kind of accelerate some of the trends we were already seeing um, and maybe just compress the time period a little bit. So um, we were already seeing increasing numbers of families moving out to the suburbs and exurbs. Um, that was already happening. A lot of the millennials and folks, you know, who flocked into the cities we're already starting to get back to the suburbs um, before this happened. And I think that that trend is almost is only going to accelerate. And, and, in a, and to some extent, I think you look at opportunities in whether it's Green Bay or Stevens Point or Appleton, nearby metro areas, Milwaukee, Madison, but especially the nearby metro areas. And you look at positioning Wapaka as, as basically a suburb because it really is. I mean, you. You know, you drive there in 30, 40 minutes, you throw on a podcast, you, you know, you might, you might as well be driving the other side of Madison or the other side of Milwaukee. So you think about, you know, that. Um, a lot of, I heard, a, I was on a webinar yesterday, you know, who, a gentleman, he thought the remote worker thing, you know, could easily, you know, um, bump, you know, go up another 20%, um, especially for mid-career professionals and recent empty nesters. And so I, I think those are two targets, you know, we, we can look at for um, recruiting people into the community. Um, and the fact, um, and then um, increased demand for space, you know, people looking for more space, they're looking for more amenities, they're looking for more open space, outdoor amenities, and you guys have that in spades. Fewer larger gatherings, fewer, um, you know, big events, a lot of, you know, no rock fest, no mile of music, no, you know, so these big gatherings that are happening you know, in bigger cities, you're not going to have them. So what does that mean? Well, there may be an increased demand for smaller, more local, you know, arts and culture gatherings, and, and that may be something that the city could tap into. And then increased demand for high-speed connectivity. And then the flip side, the opportunities, it's sort of the flip side of those. Um, you know, it's leveraging a lot of these strengths we talked about before. Um, so this kind of gets, a, I guess, it's a little more into the economic development chapter and strategies and marketing. Um, but I thought I would just kind of leave, kind of end with this slide, um, just because it's kind of interesting to think about what the, what this pandemic means for Wapaka and then how we can address some of these things in the in the comp plan. So I would, oh, I guess one, I did have one last slide that was just next steps. I'll bring a, the draft land use transportation chapter to um, uh, plan commission next month. We're still planning to meet 
that would be the intent to, br to bring that chapter forward next next month. So with that, I guess I would entertain any uh, questions or, or comments. Uh, Andrew, thank you. A uh, lot to think about, obviously, that uh, maybe we didn't really think about either as we go forward, but I you and I had the discussion yesterday about uh, residential and, you know, for the many years that uh, we have been involved in local government, we have been driving to bring more industry to our community. And now we find out that, uh, you know, even with the industry we have, we don't have enough residents to uh, fill those positions. So I think uh, a residential drive is, is a, is a major plan for us for the future, obviously. Yeah, I think that's a good, you know, it's a good problem to have. I mean, I, in some ways it's, it reminds me of, you know, it's kind of the, like the challenge of Fulton Street. I mean, it's a real strength. Um, you have the jobs, um, Fulton Street, you have a lot of national chains, franchises, you have a ton of economic activity it's sort of harnessing it and directing it in 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 the way that's going to add value to the community so it's it, you're coming your position you're approaching this from a position of strength rather than weakness um i think in in terms of of this which is exciting because you know i don't i don't think we need we're not grasping at straws here we're, we're looking at i think some real actionable strategies to to, to drive this uh, Andrew, this is Pat. Uh, I, I also kind of like the concept that you put forth that we, we truly are a suburb of metropolitan areas. I mean, I know a lot of people like to think we're just a small hometown uh, community with our own identity, and, and to a certain extent we are. But if we think that we're not close enough to, as you pointed out, the number of people who commute every day to our larger communities, whether it's Point or Appleton, Green Bay, Oshkosh, whatever, uh, we're, foolish we're foolish if we don't think that that's happening all the time. So we might just as well market ourselves, if we could, to those communities as a quote-unquote bedroom community. And that's really not a negative term. It's just a reality term. Yeah, I, I totally agree. You know, it's kind of, I did a lot of work out in you know, Sherwood uh, 10 years ago, and they're a little bit closer to town. But, you know, it's a bedroom community. But if you drive from Sherwood out to Wisconsin by High Cliff. Um, if you drive from Sherwood over to the mall, that's takes, it's the same time that it would take to drive from Wapaka to the mall. So you have, you know, the mall, it's the largest agglomeration of, of commercial real estate in the entire state of Wisconsin. Um, and you are within, you know, half an hour drive of it. So I, I, it's a, I think it's a really good point and, you know, something that you don't necessarily think about. Um, even talking to you know, talk to friends or family that live in our larger metro areas. And, you know, they, it's very, you know, a lot of people live in Appleton, work in Green Bay or live in at Green Bay, work in Oshkosh. And, and those are 30, 45 minute drives. Andrew, this is John. Uh, if I could, didn't one of your slides show that, you know, 5,000 people were coming into Wapaka though? And, and I, I was kind of surprised by that slide that it showed more people were actually coming here than leaving uh, to go to work every day. Was that, yeah. did I, did that right? You got that right. Yeah. No, that jumped out at me. But, and that, that uh, there it is, that inflow, they call that, it, so this is um, from on the map uh, census data, and they only update this every five years. So this is actually from 2017. But um, yeah. It's inflow outflow data, and it uh, and it's the highest. They call it the inflow outflow gap, um, but you have the highest gap of any city in in the county. But yeah, that's right. You got over five thousand people commuting in every day. That, yeah, that that kind of goes against the uh, you know we're the suburb uh, mentality. I guess that people come here to uh, to work. I think one of the goals here should be to to find out. You know, that's a lot of people, 5,021 people coming here every day. How do we get them to go to school here? How do we get them to live here and want to be part of this community? You know, yeah. 
I'm one of the 2168 that works in point, <laughs> but that I'm, I'm surprised in a good way, very surprised that there's that many people that we can try to attract to become part of our community. No, I, I totally agree. And the, the great part about it is there's like two opportunities here, right? The second one is um, the 2168, um, you know, is, is a little harder to nail down because those people are going all over the place. But the 5,000, you know, we know where they're going. So if, we, if we're talking about marketing or reaching those people, you know, they're going to the foundry. They're going to, um, you know, we don't even have in here the, the veterans home, but they're going to your employers, they're going to the county, they're going to the theta care, they're going to the city hall, you know, they're the, and so we, we sort of know who those workers are. So in terms of marketing strategy, it becomes a little clearer there too. And Andrew, if you don't mind, if I jump in for just a second, John, you, you did hit the nail on the head there. One thing we're working on right now with the school district and the chamber, us, um, and we've had some conversations with large employers is jumping off of that marketing the brand guidelines that we have and, and creating a strategy to market to residents. And this exactly, this slide is exactly what we've talked about is low hanging fruit. So within the next, actually probably next council meeting is when we're planning to bring uh, something forward that's a little more detailed uh, as far as what that strategy will look like. But yeah, I mean, how many people are living in Wild Rose that work at the courthouse? Or how many people are living in Watoma? Or how many people are living in Point? Or whatever it may be, Amherst. Um, you know, they already work here. We, we think Wapak is a pretty awesome place to live if you're going to live anywhere. And um, we just have to tell people about that. Well, you know, going along with that, Aaron, um, I, I, right now, and this is, I know it's pandemic driven, but um, I have a couple of my children who are home for the summer or will be part of the time. And of course, what they need or want are the infrastructure. They need good Wi-Fi service, which I think we, we have, but we maybe ought to be really conscientious of that in the future because, as he pointed out, some of that pandemic changes isn't going to just go back to the old way, but sometimes those remote things are going to be real important. So we need to be cognizant of if they have those, if we have those kinds of infrastructure facilities available, some people might say, hey, I don't need to go back to Milwaukee. I can stay right here and do my work from home, find a place to live and call it home. But I think we have to be cognizant of some of those basics so that, as you say, to attract the people to stay here, we need to provide the services that will, in fact, you know, uh, allow them to do that from a business point of view. I agree. I think, yeah, I agree 100 percent. And we're, you know, we're looking at just to piggyback on that real quick, you know, as we start to sort of dissect that and that marketing uh, plan that um, we're working on, you know, you've you've got people who may find WAPAC a very attractive place to live um, and they may come here and they may not need jobs. They, they may just move here. Um, they may be um, of means. Uh, they may be retiring. They may not um, need jobs. Um, some of those folks may come uh, with the ability to work remotely. I think, as somebody said on the call the other day, you know, Twitter and I don't know some of these other companies all of a sudden have said, "Hell, go anywhere in the country. Uh, you don't. You're not coming back to the office. You can work wherever the hell you want to." So they they can bring their jobs with them, right? So we have that category of people that can bring their jobs with them, and then we have another class of people that can create their own jobs. So we have. Um, come into a city like Wapaka and find a low cost of, of doing business and find a very attractive, say, downtown or a very commercially vibrant Fulton Street corridor, and they can come here and create their own jobs. So there's there's kind of several different ways to kind of look at that. Awesome. Andrew, this is Jeff. A quick question on the 5021 inflow. Yeah. Um, I would suspect, and I'm not sure if you have this, but I would suspect a pretty significant percentage of that number are residents of Wapaka County that are coming into the city of Wapaka to work. Would you agree? Yeah, it's about 70% on both sides. And so um, the folks that are coming in, you know, skew a little bit more towards, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously the surrounding counties, but it skews a little bit 
skews a little bit more towards Shawano and some of the more rural counties. The folks that are leaving, going to work elsewhere, it skews a little bit more towards Outagamie and, and Winnebago, but it's about 70% uh, within, um, from within Wapaka County. And my second question, if you could go to the housing value slide again. Oh, was it the demand slide or the existing values? It was housing value slide. I think it was called. It showed the, um, there we go. So one of the interesting things here is you look at the column on the left for owner-occupied units, and you see the, just the preponderance of uh, units that are based at $150,000 or less. And I think at first blush, when you're looking at this data from the city of Madison or the city of Chicago, you, you start to say, well, you know, do I really want to live in a $125,000 house? The thing to keep in mind is that $125,000 house in Wapaka, if you picked that up and stuck it in Milwaukee or Madison or Chicago, it would be a $350,000 home. Your, your housing stock, particularly your historic housing stock, is really, really good stuff. And so the, the value here, I don't think it's not representative of the quality of the housing. It's representative of the housing market, if that makes sense. So when you have the chain demand um, marketing strategy, I think one of the things is to make sure that there's imagery attached to data like 100 to 150,000 or 50,000 to 100,000. Because as Andrew points out, it's an ideal opportunity to attract a young workforce. And the housing that they'd move into at 100,000 is, it's just light years more than they could get in any of the communities they're covered, if that makes sense. No, that's, that's a good point. Um, yeah, no, I think that's a good point, Jeff. I guess the, the other thing I'm going to mention on this, you know, I'm sort of tiptoeing into um, politically incorrect territory here. Um, but one of the things you're going to find uh, when you are a city leader, whether it's Wapaka or Appleton or anywhere else as a municipality, you know, the, the poorer housing units oftentimes are clustering in the cities around social services uh, in areas where, um, you know, affordable housing is developed or in areas we've, and um, so there is a need to provide affordable housing and I, and especially the, the workforce housing piece. Um, and I'm, I'm the, and I'm not going to shy away from that. I spent the first part of my career, five years, you know, developing affordable housing in Arizona. So I'm, I'm not anti affordable housing. Um, but I also think it's important to take a balanced approach and not let your whole housing strategy get, you know, co-opted by this sort of rush to affordability. Um, the reality is you have a lot of affordable units. Um, let's let's clean them up, make sure they, they're they're good shape. But the say the forces of gentrification, I think gentrification, that you know, that term gets bantered around a lot nationally, but I just don't think it's relevant for Wapaka. I really don't. I think that the we need to do both. It needs to be a two pronged strategy. Um, but you need to get, I believe the city really needs to think about getting significant, really needs to think about getting um, significantly more um, higher value rental and owner occupied housing in, in the city um, because it needs to be a balance and you don't want all of that property tax base to go out to the towns and, you know, the, the towns aren't going to be taking proactive action to develop affordable housing. Uh, may happen somewhat naturally in, in more rural parts, but it has to be a balanced approach and I think well thought out. And so I, I guess I'm kind of a big fan of of um, just making sure that cities like Wapaka, where I work in, you know, understand that, you know, there's nothing wrong with, you know, going after that higher end market, you know, to, to balance out uh, what they already have. Andrew, thank you very much. And actually, for everyone else, this is the first time I've seen this. Andrew texted me this afternoon to kind of go through this with me, and I wasn't able to um, as we were in meetings. But, uh, Andrew, uh, thanks. I think this is very good information. I look forward to talking to you a little more in detail uh, later this week. About this. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Jeff, do you want to... Uh,
Anything to, anything add, to add to our Monday night's meeting that uh, you want to talk about tonight? I think as Andrew alluded to, I probably talked enough Monday night. I mean, if there are any specific questions that um, that weren't addressed uh, during that meeting, I'd be happy to take a run at them now. But I think we have our quick path forward. We're looking at a draft of the ordinance to the plan commission within the next couple of three weeks. And then after that, we'll uh, schedule a presentation and then as quickly as we can get to a public hearing and eventual adoption. Okay. Sounds great. Sounds great. All right. All right. Uh, let's go to reports. Uh, Aaron, you got to. Yeah. The only thing I want to touch on here, guys, is uh, from an economic development standpoint, some pretty exciting news. We just talked at length about it and the strategy to get residents and housing and um, maybe a little even over commercial and how that could lead to possible commercial. Um, so we found out. Uh, probably three, four weeks ago that CAP Services had sold 12 lots in the Eastgate subdivision for single family development. And those covenants do have a 12 month window in which those have to be developed from the purchase date. So we can expect 12 homes to go up there in the very near future. And then at the same time, or while that was happening, uh, we actually were able to speak with those same developers uh, those same developers are Green Tree Construction out of uh, Stevens Point. Uh, they were interested in the lots that we had for sale in the Swan Park area or the Woodridge subdivision. They purchased, we just got the signed paperwork, uh, I think it was yesterday or maybe today, um, and the and the check for 16 lots, um, which we kind of worked it out. We had some covenants. Typically, we would say they have to develop within 18 months. Um, because of the sheer number of lot, lots they had, uh, we did write in that contract that they had to, we gave them 36 months to get all 16 developed. So, you know, that's about 30 houses, single family, just from that one, um, that one contractor that we're, that we're expecting to, to see developed in the next, uh, two to three years. So Aaron, um, the, the purchase of the lots is one thing. What, what about the quality of the homes that are going up? Are there any uh, restrictions? I don't want to, restrictions, not the right word, expectation. Yeah, they all meet the, the, both of those neighborhood covenants. So they're both, they're aware of that. That was part of the contract. Um, I can tell you that from a price point standpoint, uh, they're looking at selling the homes in the cap sub uh, cap services subdivision for about, uh, 180 to 200 and or maybe maybe 210 and then in this in the Woodridge or Swan Park area from about 200 to 240 is, is the range that they expect to sell those on that and when when would we or any of us uh, see any actual construction begin uh, well very 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 soon we've got to so we have to set a closing date yet we've got the signed contract um, we'll set that closing date in the next week or two and then uh, in cap services, actually, they may already be started, to be quite honest with you. So on top of that, there's actually um, another contractor that has purchased uh, two more lots in the Foxfire. So not our property, but so so there's momentum from a single family housing standpoint. The only other thing that I think I did mention, the Mosaic, um, the developer that we're working with that has some interest in applying for the WIDA tax credit for workforce housing. Um, they're very interested in doing a townhouse type setup. Um, they are working with some landowners as a result of a conversation Andrew and I had with them um, and some sites that we identified as what we thought would be good for multi-unit housing. Um, but, you know, one challenge we're seeing is that, you know, we don't control a lot of those sites. They're private landowners that control them. Um, obviously, with things, with those programs, it always helps any incentive you can give if you control that land. Um, so working through that process, certainly, certainly uh, not a dead thing, but um, but they are, they're still interested and I had a conversation with them this week, so we'll see where that goes. That's about it. Those are the highlights. Thanks, Aaron. Anybody else have anything else for the meeting? Looking for a motion to adjourn. Uh, we had a motion by Olson, second by Keelan, was that? Yes. That we adjourn. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 aye.
Motion carried. Motion carried. Uh, we're adjourned at uh, 6.37 p.m. Everybody drive safe. Have a great night.